Hello, and welcome to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian L. Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guest is Victoria L. Schwartz, Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and Associate Professor of Law at Pepperdine University School of Law. We will discuss her article, The Celebrity Stock Market, which was published in the UC Davis Law Review. So welcome to the program, Victoria. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, uh, my, my my pleasure. I really enjoyed reading your paper, which, although I've worked on similar issues, was not something I'd I'd directly heard about before, and I found it really really fascinating. But but for listeners who might not be you know so familiar with securities law or securitization of of assets, um, maybe you could talk a little bit about kind of. Conceptually speaking, what is a celebrity stock market or what might a celebrity stock market be? And more to the point, like what would it try to what would it be trying to solve? What what problem would be addressed by a celebrity stock market, at least potentially? Sure. So everyone's probably familiar with the more traditional stock markets. If I'm an entrepreneur and I have an idea for a business. I might go out and get funding from venture capitalists and other folks. And eventually, if I go public, then, you know, as the term explains, the public has the chance to buy and sell stock in that company. And uh, sort of as the company does well, the investors do better. uh, And as the company does worse, the investors do worse. Um, We have not traditionally had a similar way to handle if instead of an entrepreneur, if I'm an aspiring celebrity, so maybe a talented musician or an actor or an athlete or really any form of celebrity, um, but it's kind of a similar concept because right with companies, the idea is that someday the company is going to make a lot of money, but in the short run, they have funding needs. Similarly, once somebody's already a celebrity, they're going to make a lot of money But what happens in the meantime while they're trying to make it? How do they fund themselves? And kind of our existing system has been a little bit hodgepodge in what that looks like and how we do that funding. So the idea of a celebrity stock market, which uh, some startups have kind of toyed with variations of one, is that we would do something that looks kind of like a stock market for aspiring celebrities. So the idea is that the celebrity would sell a share of their future income. So someday they're going to make a lot of money. They sell a share of that future income to potential investors. And the investors give them money right now because right now is when they need the money. And down the line, when they sort of make it as a celebrity, the investors get a share of their future income. And then the sort of stock market part is you can take that share and you can sort of convert it into stock and then people can buy and sell shares in that future income, just like they would any other stock. Right. So you sort of frame it broadly as a version of what you refer to as human equity investments, which sounds from the paper like it's an idea that might have a you know a, a meaningful pedigree, but it sounds like a limited number of kind of real world applications. So so just to kind of flesh out what you just said, like what exactly would a human equity investment more broadly be and sort of what are the potential benefits or concerns about liberalizing uh how people could go about making human equity investments. Yeah, so human equity investments more generally, besides the context of the sort of celebrities that my paper focuses on, is this idea uh, of kind of buying and selling shares in a human's future success. And it's traditionally come up in the educational context. And there's quite a few scholars and even sort of politicians who have talked about it as an alternative to our um, existing system by which we fund education, which is a government-backed loan system. So in traditional education, if you wanna go to school and you can't afford to go to school, you basically can get a loan from the government and you you, you, you take out the money and then you'll have to pay that loan back with a set percentage interest, right? Sort of, you know, like a traditional bank loan would be. Uh, That's how we do education. 
Um, and it's sort of set at the same rate no matter what. The idea of a human equity trading in the education context, similar to in the celebrity stock market context, is instead of it being a set loan with a set return of investment of a particular percentage, is that the investor gets more money if the human, who's the source of the human equity, sort of the person you're investing in, does better, right? So uh, if you were to do this in the context of school, you invest in, say, the world you and I live in, uh, an aspiring law student, right? Let's say there's a law student who can't afford to go to, to law school. Uh, we might choose to sort of invest in them, thinking, you know, someday they're going to go work at a law firm, be making a nice six-figure salary. I'll take a 10%, a 5%, whatever percent share of that salary in the future. And in the meantime, uh, I'll pay for their law school. Mm. And by doing, and sort of assuming they do as well as I and predicting that they're going to do the front end, I'll do better than the, you know, three, five, seven, whatever the set rate of return would be in a government loan. Right. So is, is part of the idea there maybe that it could like spread risk around to some degree in the sense, like if I'm investing in my own human capital or human equity by going to law school and take on a loan for it, I have like all the risk of my like my success or failure. But if other people can invest in it, then they can buy just a small amount of that risk and they can spread it a bunch of, uh, spread it among a bunch of different law students and they're thereby sort of even out some of the risk associated with the investment. Would that be like one potential benefit of kind of shifting the structure around that way? Yeah, that's exactly right. That's one of the major benefits. And it's exact same kind of benefit that we use traditional stock markets for. So, you know, that's, you know, when, when we do it for companies, that's one of the major reasons we, you know, have companies go public to sort of share both risk and reward. And uh, you could do it sort of similarly with future success, not in a company, but in an individual human's future success. Okay. So in your, in your paper, you talk a little bit, or you actually talk significantly about how like people have discussed this issue in the context of student loans. But the, the bulk of your paper, as you say, focuses on, on celebrities and, or artists and, and athletes and other people kind of engaged in various forms of entertainment or entertainment like, um, areas of activity. Um, and, and you talk about kind of historical and existing models for investing in, in human equity in that context. Could you talk a little bit about kind of how we try to solve this problem now to the extent that we do and what sort of the weaknesses or potential liabilities associated with our, our current efforts are? Yeah, absolutely. When I first started looking into some of these ideas regarding the celebrity stock market, I immediately noticed a bunch of potential problems, but I, I don't believe in evaluating proposals kind of on their face. I feel like you have to evaluate them in comparison to what the alternatives are. So while, as I'm sure we'll talk about later, there are a bunch of sort of potential issues with celebrity stock markets, the question is, are those issues worse than the other ways we could share risk and help people invest in sort of their future in these entertainment industries. And so uh, as opposed to, as I mentioned in the education space, where the baseline comparison is you have to compare human equity trading markets to government backed guaranteed loans. That's sort of the relevant comparison. And in that context, it's not clear to me that human equity trading necessarily stacks up when that's the baseline. But in the celebrity space, we kind of have this weird hodgepodge of the ways that we uh, currently, you know, before a world in which we have celebrity stock markets, if you want to be an aspiring entertainer, we're a little bit all over the place for how we go about funding that. I mean, the reality, Pepperdine is located here in Los Angeles, right? And in Los Angeles, if you go out to dinner for a meal, odds are you're going to have a wait staff who's very talented in something other than being white staff. <laughs> Many of them are, are, are sort of, you know, aspiring songwriters and actors and dancers and all sorts of other things. And kind of that's the existing system by which they're paying their bills until they make it. Mm. And so then this sort of argument or the question is, okay, rather than them doing that from a societal perspective, 
wouldn't we be better off if they were spending their time not waiting tables, but working on their music or their mm -hmm. art of whatever form it is, if they had a financial way to do that? Mm -hmm. um, and so depending on, depending on the aspects of the entertainment industry, we've done it very differently. So mm -hmm. in the athletic space, we have sort of a combo of things, right? We do a kind of hybrid educational model where for some sports, you sort of can go to college for a few years on a scholarship, you can't get paid under our NCAA system, but you at least can go to school maybe as a way to sort of get some training until you go pro. But in other sports, that's not the case. Uh, and there's a lot of sports sort of that, you know, might be extremely expensive to fund along the way. And of course, even in the school context, I mean, you're still not getting paid. So, you know, we hear these horrible stories of, of athletes, you know, who, because of NCAA rules, you know, can't afford to feed themselves on the days that they're not getting food from their sports teams. Mm. Mm. Similarly, uh, the baseball example I talk about in the paper, um, you know, many people spend a lot of time in the minor leagues in baseball, either instead of or even after doing college sports. And in the minor leagues, players make less than nothing. Uh, and they might spend many, many years sort of doing that, uh, you know, barely able to sort of provide for their families, et cetera. So sort of in that context, the question is, what if they could sell stock in their future share of their, you know, success, should they ever make it in the major leagues and therefore spread out the risk, as you mentioned, right? So that, you mm. know, if they make it, you know, their investors do well with them. But in the meantime, while they're languishing in the minor leagues, uh, sort of they can afford to pay the bills with sort of the investment money that comes in. So that's how it looks in the athletic arena. If you look at it in sort of some of the other arenas, we have a very, we currently have a very um, agent driven system. So it's very hard to get work in music or in film or in television unless you have an agent. And it's very difficult to get an agent if you haven't already made it. So we kind of have this gatekeeper function that these agencies have that have all sorts of, you know, biases and other concerns implicit in them. Uh, and again, you know, one idea behind the celebrity stock market is that it helps democratize that process away from the agents. So it struck me, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but it, it seemed like in the educational context, I mean, there's there's some risk associated with with outcomes. In other words, we don't know which college students or which law students are going to be very successful, moderately successful, not so successful, but not nearly as high of a risk as there is when it comes to different kinds of celebrities. In other words, with celebrities, it's like some of them are super successful and some of them are totally unsuccessful, right? And in addition, it seems like in the educational context, we've got the government is kind of the intermediary spreading around a lot of that risk. I mean, the government's pretty good at that. Whereas in the celebrity context, it seems like it's it's all private investment. I mean, there's no government loans to become a, a rock star. Um, do, do, do those differences potentially make a kind of human equity uh, market more attractive than they would in a educational context? Yes, absolutely. Uh, as I mentioned, I think you have to evaluate it in comparison to the alternative. And because in education, we have these government backed loans, that's a pretty solid alternative. You know, if you want to get an education in our government backed loan system, you basically can, uh, you know, obviously with some, with some, with some serious caveats for what that looks like, but you basically can choose to get an education. Um, not so, right? If you want to be an aspiring, athlete, entertainer, et cetera, you know, if you have mouths to feed, you probably can't afford to work for five years in the minor leagues. You probably can't afford if you have mouths to feed to, uh, you know, give your dream of becoming a successful musician five years until you make it. You can't afford to do any of those things. And there's not something like a government backed loan or really even a bank loan that's going to let you fund yourself, right? To sort of pay your day to day rent and bills and everything else. Uh, there's not really a good place for you to get funded and it's hard to get your foot in the door. And the agents I mentioned, 
they kind of are sharing the risk in the sense that agents take you on in exchange typically for about a 10% share in, in, in what you're making. So mm. they're already doing some of this work you mentioned and sort of trying to evaluate who's going to be successful uh, because they get paid sort of on a percentage basis. But if we expand that to the public more generally, we'll sort of remove some of the, the, the problems that the agency model has. Right. So, so part of the problem here then be that potentially like private capital for investment is a little thin and that there's just not enough money to go around to sort of maximize the potential human equity out there? I'm not sure I would say that there's not enough money to go around. I think I would say that there's not a good process in which to invest in these aspiring celebrities. Sort of there's not that the market has not been created yet. Or mm. you know, a few startups have started with it. So even if I wanted to, right? Even if I let's say I was I'm I happen to be an avid hockey player. So a uh, hockey player, hockey fan. I wish I was a mm-hmm. player. <laughs> so, uh, so let's say, you know, I actually thought this is not the case, but let's say I thought I was actually pretty good at like, you know, identifying who might be a great up and coming hockey player. If I wanted to sort of invest in their future career so that if they make it, I get a, you know, 5% share in their future NHL salary in exchange for however much money up front now, the only way for me to do that is by private contract, right? I, I could mm-hmm. reach out to that person and give them the money pursuant to an individualized private contract, but that's super inefficient, right? Like the whole mm. reason with companies we have stock markets sort of more generally is to sort of remove the transaction costs involved in doing that. We haven't removed those transaction costs yet in the celebrity space. And so everything would have to be done by individually negotiated contracts. Mm, mm, mm. That makes sense. So it's in, in many respects more of a transactions cost problem than a uh, availability of capital problem in the sense that there might be money. There just isn't an effective way to, for people to deploy it into this market. I think that's right. Yeah. Okay. Well, so to the extent people have tried to operationalize some form of human equity uh, investments, you know, what have they done and how have it worked? I mean, you, you mentioned a few examples, like one famous one with, with David Bowie and then some kind of tentative efforts to create, um, ways, ways to invest in, in people's future income streams. Maybe you could describe some of those and like sort of what people tried to do and sort of what was, what was effective and what wasn't. Absolutely. So there've been a few startups in this space, uh, Probably the most prominent one that was the most successful, at least for a time being, and the closest to what I'm describing, was a company that was called Fantex. Uh, Fantex was basically a celebrity stock market in the athletic space. So they were dealing with athletes specifically, although while they were around, the CEO would talk quite a bit about expanding to other forms of entertainment. Uh, And the way Fantech structured their markets while they were in existence is they, Fantech, reached uh, contractual deals with athletes. Initially, they were all football players in which they uh, contracted for, they basically would give the athletes millions of dollars up front. So the first IP, the first example of this was supposed to be uh, Arian Foster. And the deal was supposed to be that Fantex would pay him $10 million up front. So he just gets $10 million. In exchange, Fantex would get a 20% share of all of his future income, including his salary, his endorsements, basically any money he made from any source for the rest of his life. So he gets $10 million now, they get a 20% share in everything forever. So he gets injured, so that deal never goes through. And instead, they go forward. The very first one was with Vernon Davis, who at the time was sort of playing for the San Francisco 49ers. And in their in that case, again, it's all a specific contract. So Fantex con- sort of entered into a contract with Vernon Davis. They paid him $4 million up front in exchange for a 10% share in all of his income from every source forever. So now we've got sort of step one of the process. He gets $4 million up front. They get a 10% share. The risk is shared because he's got $4 million in the bank right now, you know, 
no matter what happens. And they have a 10% share in his upside, you know, of his future endorsement deals and salary and everything else. And then Fantex is itself going to share the risk in the form of a stock market. So mm. Fantex then opens up sort of a, in air quotes, quote unquote, stock in Vernon Davis. And they say, we're going to, you can buy a share in Vernon Davis stock at sort of 10 bucks a share. They sort of sell all of these shares and then uh, you can buy and sell these shares on their sort of pseudo market. And of course, you're not really buying a, st- a share in Vernon Davis. You're buying a share in Fantex's uh, contractually agreed upon share in his future income. Mm. And that could be bought and sold and sort of just like any other stock would. And after that sort of IPO with Vernon Davis, Fantex signed contracts with at least 20 more athletes uh, and had at least six IPOs uh, in which, that were worth over $64 million. So wow. they were they were really doing this for a while. And uh, at some at, at some point they folded, but they, they really did try this. And mm-hmm. the suspicion is that they folded because they were relying on a commission-based business model. That's how they were making money. Um, mm. But there are potentially other models that might work better. Mm, mm. But maybe you could describe the difference between them. What, what, what does it mean to say they were working on a commission-based model and, and what other approaches might they have taken? I mean, they could take, you know, they could just get a share. They could, you know, commission-based is, you know, they would get a commission for, for each of this sort of the way, you know, probably listeners who buy and sell stocks might have a broker who gets a commission every time sort of a trade is made. Uh-huh. So, uh, so that sort of, that was the model they were making. And just like sort of in other investments, you know, they could, they could take a share off the top. They could say, you know, they get X percent and only part of it goes into the IPO. There's various ways you could structure it. The particular way they structured it seems to have not worked. They weren't making yeah. enough money off those commissions. Right. And the other example you give in the paper is the, the Bowie bonds example, which yeah. did at least, <clears throat> at least yeah. in my understanding existed for a while. Yeah. So the Bowie bonds isn't actually a pure example of a celebrity stock market. Um, I give it as an example of kind of a hybrid, like early predecessor before the celebrity stock market. And I'll explain why. Uh, so if, 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 so I'll tell you what it is and then I'll explain the difference. So David Bowie late in his career uh, experimented with a method in which he was exchanging future royalty income for dollars now. So these were, he was already a very famous artist. He already had his sort of, you know, 25 albums and sort of, you know, he'd already created all of his music, but a lot of the money he was going to get on that music was in the form of future royalties. So he traded kind of a share in his future royalty income, you know, his copyright interests in those existing work in exchange for like $55 million up front. So there's a lot of similarities between this and a celebrity stock market, but the difference is he was, he was cashing out on a share of future royalties for works that already existed. I think the idea of the celebrity stock market would be somebody doing that. It would be David Bowie entering into that deal before he made his 25 albums in order to help him fund the creation of those albums. Uh So kind of early, so earlier on to sort of say, how can he afford to take the time to make those 25 albums? Well, somebody bets that he's going to someday become David Bowie and uh, give him money, you know, up front in exchange for a share in that future IP that has not yet been created. Right. Right. So in, in both examples, it seems like, I mean, in obviously in Bowie's case, he was already very famous and had a, there was, you know, a lot of information out there about what his future revenue stream was going to look like, but, and I'm not a sports person, but it sounds like the athletes you were talking about were, you know, young athletes, but with a high probability, at least among athletes of future success, right? I mean, that people were willing to invest a lot of money in them because there was a reasonable, you know, likelihood that they would have significant uh, financial success in the relatively near term. It seems like, yeah, I mean, it seems like part of your proposal is kind of aiming at least potentially to dig deeper 
than that to people who have less clear <laughs> likelihood of success, like where the information costs associated with determining what will be a good investment and a, a not good investment might be might be considerably higher. Um, sort of, you know, to what extent do you think it's possible for a market to do that? Would it need to just be a whole lot broader and include a whole lot more people so that you could spread the risk even more broadly? Or would there need to be like some ways of like generating more information? I mean, like, would you have like a prospectus requirement for a celebrity who wanted to come on to a market to sort of disclose their future plans so that people could evaluate whether or not it was a viable project or sort of have you, have you, you know, th thought about like how deep you could go into that pool of potential celebrities as a practical matter? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I mean, Fantex sort of started with low hanging fruit, exactly as you say, sort of folks who were already in the NFL, but early in their career. Uh, if this concept of mine were to really be actualized, uh, you're exactly right that I would anticipate it would go backwards, right? It would identify people much earlier in their careers in order to, um, and then again, as always, higher risk, higher reward, right? Earlier on in their careers, you probably would negotiate for higher than a 10% share, right? With Vernon Davis, you know, he got a lot of money for only a 10% share because it was a pretty good chance that that 10% share was going to be of a lot of money. You might need to take a higher share of someone for whom there is more risk. And like with all stocks, right? Typically, it's not a winning strategy to just purchase a single stock and have that be your future. I think the exact same thing would be true here, where sort of, sort of, there would be sort of, you know, you could, you could imagine the entire market developing where sort of you, you, individual investors and institutional investors would share the risk by kind of, you know, investing in large numbers of aspiring celebrities. Right. Right. So I guess part of me wonders if like, in a sense, the ability to invest in say, a music business company or a sports industry company of one kind or another isn't like kind of in some sense a proxy for what you're talking about. And I wonder whether like, it, I mean, I, I guess it seems to me like the idea is that maybe like cutting out the middleman a little bit might potentially be more efficient than relying on these private intermediaries. Is that like, is that a, a rough approximation of of the idea? I mean, kind of, except that like the private intermediaries, which is usually sort of talent agents, I'm not aware of any publicly traded talent agencies. Right, so, right. You know, the agents are investing sort of in their clients, but, you know, if other investors wanted it to invest in the clients, there's not really a way to do that. Mm. Hmm. Yeah, I was thinking more of like, if I want to invest in like the Universal Music Group or something like that. I mean, in a sense, I'm investing in the future, um, the, the, the future productivity of the celebrities, but it's just a really attenuated relationship between me as the investor and the celebrity. And it seems like your proposal is sort of bringing the investor and the producer closer together. That's right. Yeah. The idea is that sort of in order to get yourself to the point where you're signed with a record company, you almost certainly have to already have an agent and sort of like kind of be well on your way. But there are so many talented sort of, I mean, if you just think of so many of the big stories, you know, you know, pretty major celebrities who, you know, were quote unquote discovered. Uh, and the discovered part feels so much like luck of the draw and sort of with more information, you could sort of cut out the kind of, luck port i mean it wouldn't completely eliminate it but it would somewhat reduce the sort of luck part of the story right mm. Th that that we think of when we think of sort of you know aspiring let's say songwriters or or, or talented singers being discovered mhm mm mm -hmm. so d are there any like potential concerns uh, associated with this kind of like securitization of celebrity as it were like what kind of problems might it pose both practical and maybe, you know, normative as well. Are there, are there objections people might have on sort of moral or ethical grounds to this kind of, of uh, creating this kind of market? Absolutely. And, and these are concerns that I very much share, even though I ultimately in the paper, I lay out the case for allowing celebrity stock markets. I do so basically by saying it's not clear to me that it's worse than the status quo. 
But that's not to say that there aren't problems with it. One of the biggest ones in the paper, I call it the ick factor. Um, there's something a little bit troubling about the idea of treating humans like corporations that can be bought and sold. And that probably goes back quite a bit to sort of the history of slavery in this country. And that's probably what triggers some of that ick factor. And even though this isn't slavery and does not raise sort of 13th Amendment and other concerns sort of as a legal matter, it still creates some problems where we sort of potentially feel uncomfortable with it. What I ultimately conclude, though, is it's not clear to me that that ick factor isn't also present in a lot of the other ways we treat aspiring celebrities, right? Like the NCAA system arguably has that same ick factor where kind of there's this NCAA making a ton of money off of sort of college athletes, many of whom are minorities and don't see any of that money. So mm. I kind of feel like even though that ick factor is a big concern, at least under a celebrity stock market system, the athlete or celebrity would actually get the money up front as opposed to some of the other ways that we do it. So that's sort of on the normative side. On the legal side, there's all sorts of concerns. Uh, there's sort of questions about how would it work you know, would we allow juniors to enter into these contracts? A lot of times in some sports and other celebrity, if you think about a lot of the most famous musicians, you know, like a Taylor Swift of this world, they sort of, they get really good when they're teenagers. How do we feel about teenagers signing away their future income forever? Do we want those contracts to be enforceable? Those are really hard questions that we have all the time in contract law, you know, how to deal mm. with sort of uh, minors. And, and that's, that's a problem here too. Uh, but again, it's the same kind of problem, not a different kind of problem that you would have with sort of a teenager signing with a talent agent who's going to get a 10% share. So uh, mm -hmm. sort of there's lots of problems here. They're just not obviously worse to me than the problems we have with the existing models. Yeah, you do mention disclosure questions or kind of privacy questions as well. Sort of how troubling do you think those are? And is it enough that people could opt out of participating in MR, a stock market of this kind and thereby not be expected to disclose? Is that kind of like voluntariness element sufficient to sort of mitigate those concerns? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. I actually consider myself primarily a privacy scholar. And most of my earlier work was in the context of sort of um, the privacy of corporate executives and under what circumstances should corporate executives be allowed to keep sort of their private information private. And so this work kind of builds off of that in a different space. And what I point out in the paper is that so we as a society have pretty much come to terms with the fact that celebrities, once they've made it as celebrities, have mostly given up their privacy rights, whether it's, you know, the public figure doctrine or there's all sorts of areas in the law in which we kind of say, you know, if you're in a celebrity, if you're a celebrity, too bad. You don't get, you sort of, you, you don't get to really be a private person anymore for the most part. But what's a little troubling about the celebrity stock markets is we were just talking about a little bit earlier, if we're going to expand these markets to sort of, you know, a broad pool much earlier, right? You know, aspiring athletes long before they make it, aspiring singers and actors long before they make it. For the market to work, as we talked about, you need good information, right? People need to sort of disclose information about themselves, about their future plans, about sort of all sorts of stuff that you would want to know in order to be an informed investor. And all of that stuff is a pretty major invasion of privacy for folks who are not yet celebrities and many of whom will never become celebrities. And so that's that's a trade-off and a troubling trade-off. Ultimately, I think be, I think I would have a problem if the only way we funded celebrities was through these markets such that no one who cared about privacy could follow these paths. But I'm not I'm less troubled by the idea of celebrity stock markets as an option for funding alongside the other options that we already have so that you can opt out as you put it. Right. Right. Well, Victoria, in, in closing, you know, it, it, it's, it struck me that there's been a lot of discussion 
about sort of liberalizing the ability of private investors to invest in a different, you know, broader range uh, and a deeper sort of pool of uh, potential uh, potential business ventures. And I'm thinking of things like, you know, the, the push toward more and more crowdfunding, like equity crowdfunding and all this kind of stuff. And the idea that we want to sort of like solve some of these transaction costs that were making it difficult for capital to get to where it would be most productively used. Do you think that the proposal you're making kind of fits into that model in a way that a, that the kind of push in that direction might make something like what you describe increasingly viable? Yes, very much so. I think there's increasing interest by the public in sort of investing in these spaces and, uh, I, I, I do think that sort of even though the Fantex example didn't work, uh, there are other startups that are almost certainly going to develop in this area to sort of satisfy the public desire to invest in this space. Cool. Well, thanks so much, Victoria, for coming on the program. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. so much like you like you both had the same eyes I wanted to give her a hug and ask for girlfriend advice Michael Stipe was at the
Johnny Depp with kids and wife Would you always be super famous Or maybe someday Could you be A regular guy See?